So welcome to another Gospel Online video. This is one in a series about what everybody should know. And this video is about what everybody should know about the Bible. So we're going to spend a few minutes looking at what the Bible is. We'll start with a few facts about the Bible. And then after that, we'll see what's special about the Bible. So just start by thinking about what the Bible is. Well, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the Bible is the world's best-selling book by some margin. Uh, they estimate that about 6 billion printed Bibles are in circulation and they are being printed at a rate of about 100 million per year. Now, those figures cover all editions of the Bible in many languages. You can see on the picture here that on the spines are different languages into which the Bible has been translated. But of course, the Bible has been around for a long time. In fact, it was around before printing was even invented. And it wasn't originally written in English or in any of these other languages that we can see on the bookshelf. So let's look at what the Bible actually is. The Bible is split into two sections. The earlier section of the Bible is called the Old Testament, and that's mainly concerned with God's interactions with mankind throughout the history of one nation, the nation of Israel. And then the second part of the Bible is the New Testament, and that's mainly concerned with the teachings and the actions of Jesus Christ and of his disciples and those who followed him. So that's a good way to think of the Bible to start with. And the Old Testament, therefore, was written before Jesus in years BC, the New Testament written in years AD. Those are the big divisions of the Bible. There are many genres within those larger divisions. So the Jews, when they're talking about the Old Testament, thinking about it, they typically split it into three sections, um, the law, the prophets and the writings. And it's true that there are different types of writing um, with different character. There's, there's law, there's history, poetry, there are wisdom books, there is prophecy within the Old Testament. And similarly, the New Testament has different types of writing within it. Uh, there are the Gospels, then following that, the Acts of the Apostles, which is kind of historical account of the spread of Christianity. But then it goes on to letters that were written to individuals and churches. And there's prophecy as well in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. Now, I've said that the, the major divisions are the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we have sort of sections within those parts of the Bible. In fact, the Bible is a collection of 66 separate books. So there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. So that's a bit unusual. It's almost like a library rather than a single book. We'll have a look at that in a bit more detail in a moment. But first of all, let's just think about when the Bible was written. I said um, the Old Testament BC, the New Testament AD. Well, it was written over a period of about 1500 years. So the earliest books um, around 1400, 1500, 1400 BC, around then, um, and, and the latest ones certainly within the first century, so before 100 AD. Um, and there, there was a, a, a gap in between the writing of the Old Testament and the New Testament, up therefore, of about 400 years or so. And who wrote the Bible? Well, um, I suppose about 40 writers wrote the Bible down. Now, why can't I give a more exact figure than that? Can't I just say, oh, well, there were 66 books of the Bible. So that means there were 66 writers of the Bible. It's not quite as simple as that because some of the writers of the Bible 
wrote more than one book. For example, um, the Apostle Paul um, wrote several of the New Testament books, um, or um, Moses wrote more than one of the Old Testament books. Um, and on the other hand, you've also got writers who wrote, um, you, you have more than one writer writing a single book. So um, if we look here at the Old Testament writers that are listed out, um, all of these wrote Psalms, Asaph, uh, Ethan, let's see who else, Heman, um, Moses wrote Psalms, as well as David, who's the most famous Psalm writer. We even get Psalms that say at the top of them that they're written by the sons of Korah, of the sons of Korah. That sounds like a group of, of people. So although there are 29 names on that list there, um, there are probably more than 30 people wrote the Old Testament. And then the New Testament, well, I've said eight or nine writers. You have the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, you have the Apostle Paul writing uh, many letters. Um, and then there are others who wrote letters, James, Peter, Jude. Um, the, the reason I've said eight or nine is that there's a book, the book of Hebrews, which um, people debate a bit whether who, who wrote it. Perhaps it's by the Apostle Paul, but others think that it's by somebody completely different. And, and the author doesn't say who he is. Um, so that's why it's eight or nine, possibly, in the New Testament. As I say, about 40 different writers writing over a long period of time. Um, now, I've said that the Old Testament is made up of 39 books. There's a list of all the books um, in the Old Testament, and it's those ones at the start of the list, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, that were written around 1400 BC. Um, Book of Job is possibly also uh, an, an old book, it may be even written before that kind of time. Um, and the, the, the different sections of the Old Testament are apparent here. So you've got the law at the start, these first five books from Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then kind of history books through from Joshua um, through to Nehemiah. And then you've got, um, you've got wisdom books, you've got poetry in the, in the Psalms, um, and, and then after that, from Isaiah right through to Malachi, these books are books uh, of, of prophets, where the, the, the names of the books um, are the name of the prophet who wrote them. Um, now, this old part of the Bible, the Old Testament, was written in the Hebrew language. Um, that's not quite true. Almost all of it written in Hebrew. There are short sections in the book of Ezra and the book of Daniel, which are in a another Semitic language, the Aramaic language. Um, so th those two languages are written with the same script. In, fa in fact, what's happened is that Hebrew has adopted the Aramaic script. So the letters look the same, but they're different languages um, in the same way that I suppose English, French, German all use the same alphabet, um, the, the same script, the Latin Roman alphabet, and yet they're different languages. That's what it's like with Hebrew and Aramaic, so not the same language. Um, and in fact, we do have a few fragments of Hebrew texts of the Bible that predate that adoption of the Aramaic alphabet by um, in, in, in Hebrew. Um, so that means that some really old Hebrew texts are written with a different alphabet. It's a little bit confusing. So the, the same language um, and yet using a different script for the really old bits of Hebrew. Um, the picture we can see here is using that common um, script of Hebrew and Aramaic. That's in fact uh, a facsimile of the Leningrad Codex. So that's um, an important Hebrew manuscript from about a thousand AD, which is in a museum um, 
in, in St. Petersburg, which is why it's called the Leningrad Codex. Moving on to the New Testament, well, that um, we can see has 27 books in it. We have the four Gospels at the start, the Book of Acts, and then there are letters um, written by Paul from Romans through to Philemon, possibly Hebrews as well, and some letters by others, James to Jude, and then we have this book of Revelation, a book of prophecy at the end of the Old Testament. And he, um, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. So the Greek language um, is something that has changed gradually over time. So there is still a Greek language, modern Greek that is spoken in Greece. And um, it originated around 800 BC. And you have you know, classics of, written by Homer and, and, and the rest. Um, the New Testament sits between those two periods, and so it's not ancient classical Greek, it's not modern Greek, it's a kind of Greek called Koine Greek, which means common Greek, um, and that's the, the language that was written, that was spoken um, in the time of Jesus, it was a, it was a common language then, and that's the, the language of the New Testament, and so on in the picture here on the right, We've got a fragment of um, a papyrus called P46. Um, that's in fact Romans 8, I believe, that we can see there on the picture. And um, again, the script that Greek was written in um, kind of changed over time. The earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have are, are written all in capital letters. Um, with with no spaces in between the words, and that's what we can see here on this papyrus. Um, so the, the the thing I want to talk about now that we've just established a few book, um, facts about the Bible is what is it that is special about the Bible? And and one point I want to make is that it is historically accurate. And reliable. So we can see that from archaeology. So if we look at ancient things, inscriptions, artifacts, structures, um, then we can see that what is written in the Bible um, tallies with facts on the ground, as it were. Um, so I'm just going to show you one example. Um, there is an account in the Old Testament of King Hezekiah um, building a tunnel to divert a water supply from outside Jerusalem to deprive the Assyrian army of having a water supply when they were besieging um, Jerusalem. So this is happening in about 700 BC and it describes the way that um, Hezekiah um, diverted the water into the city of Jerusalem. Um, so there's this account in the Bible of that. Now that tunnel has been discovered, um, and indeed tourists have are, are now allowed to walk through it. Um, it's a distance of five or six hundred meters that you can walk through the tunnel, and there's a, there's a picture of that um, there on the screen. So that tunnel was discovered in 1838, so long time after. Um, it had been built um, you know, a couple of centuries ago now, and a, a bit later on, after the tunnel had been discovered, um, an inscription was found on the wall of the tunnel in 1880, and that um, inscription seems to have been written down by those who constructed the tunnel. It describes the way that they tunneled and that they um, they started at both ends of the tunnel and eventually they broke through and water began to flow from one end to the other from outside the city to within the city. So that's just one example of archaeology, um, sort of confirming that the Bible text is accurate. Um, there are lots of other examples that you can um, research for yourself. We have other videos in this channel which talk about archaeology. Um, and its connections with the Bible. 
Um, another way that we can see that there is the ring of truth in the Bible and that the, um, that the authors were close to the events that they were writing about is the idea of undesigned coincidences. So this is just the fact that the text seems to be true and not contrived. So I've got one example on the on the screen here. Um, the Israelites in the Bible left Egypt. Um, they crossed the Sinai Desert. They arrived on the east bank of the River Jordan a generation later. And from there, they crossed into Canaan, the promised land. The first town that they took was Jericho. Um, so they had to cross the River Jordan from east to west in order to enter the land. And we are told that that happened um, in the spring. Um, there's a reference here in Joshua chapter five, explaining that after they'd crossed over, they kept the Passover. Well, that's, um, that's in, in their reckoning, the 14th day of the first month. Um, in our reckoning, that's March, April time that they had just crossed over the Jordan. So it's in the springtime. Now, going back a few chapters in Joshua, we find that before they crossed into the land, they sent spies to spy out the land. And um, there's a woman by the name of Rahab who hid the spies um, so that they didn't get discovered uh, by the, the authorities in Jericho. And the way that she hid them was she took them up onto the roof of her house. She hid them under stalks of flax um, that, um, that she had on the roof. Now, the interesting thing about that is that um, the flax harvest um, would have just ended um, at this time. We know that the barley harvest was the harvest that came after the flax harvest and that began just before Passover. So the flax harvest had just happened. And so it's entirely correct that this would have been the time when people would have had flax um, on the roofs of their houses and Rahab would have had. So the, the coincidence here is just that um, to, three chapters apart, you've got these two little details which chime in together and harmonize with each other. Um, the, the writer here doesn't make a big thing about the time of year of the flax harvest. The story is just told, the spy is hid under the flax, but that's completely realistic. It's at the exact time of year when flax would be on the roofs. So that's just an example of a kind of undesigned coincidence. It makes it sound like the person who wrote this really knew about the, the kind of practices um, in, in Israel at the time um, and that they were writing a true story um, rather, than, rather than fiction. Now, there are lots of other undesigned coincidences. Again, that's something that we've covered before in this channel. So please search for, for videos on that topic. Um, Another thing I want to talk about is the way that the Bible just has a single message. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't contradict itself. It doesn't, um, it, 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 it doesn't um, have things where you're scratching your head thinking, hmm, this sounds like one of the authors didn't agree with the other authors of the Bible, but rather the themes of the Bible run from beginning to end. So I've got a couple of examples of this. One of them is just the idea, a very basic idea, but um, important idea that there is only one God. Um, and that's something that you find all the way through the Bible. I've put some dates against some verses there which talk about that. So back in one of these early books, um, fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, uh, it is declared that the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, or 700 years later, the prophet Isaiah says, or is, is told by God, I am the Lord, there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. 
You see, he's, he's reiterating the point that there aren't many gods of which he is only one. There is only one God. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does these things. Um, and then skipping on another 700 or so years to the New Testament, we find exactly the same teaching. It says that there's just one God and Father of all. Now, um, other nations certainly did believe in more than one God. The Israelites um, were surrounded by Egyptians who had many gods. Um, there were multiple gods of uh, the Canaanites, the, the, the place that they were going to. Um, and indeed, in, in New Testament times, there were many Greek gods. There were abstract ideas about of God, about him being the good and the one and so on. Um, whereas there's this consistent message within the Bible, well, there's just one God. Um, and we don't, we don't find any deviation from that, whether we're at the start of the Old Testament or in the New Testament. Just another example of a teaching which um, continues would be to look at um, the, the fact that Abraham is promised a special descendant. So back in Genesis, which is where we read about Abraham in chapter 22, Abraham is promised that he will have many offspring, like the, the stars of heaven, the sand on the seashore. Um, but then it says, your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. So it starts talking about one descendant, one offspring of Abraham. And it talks about all the nations of the earth being blessed through that one descendant of Abraham. Well, this is picked up um, later on in the Old Testament. Those promises um, are continued to King David. Um, so Abraham's being told there's going to be this kind of ruler who, who possesses the gate of his enemies. David similarly is told that after he dies, there's going to be an offspring that he has and his kingdom will last forever. Um, and he will be God's son. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And then you come to the New Testament at the beginning, before Jesus is born, the angel says to Mary um, that her son will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. So Mary is told that her son, the Lord Jesus, is going to rule forever. And then um, we move to the section of the New Testament, the letters, and in Galatians, um, the Apostle Paul quotes Genesis. And it you know, says, it, I, I, I am in complete agreement with what was written, and in fact, um, what was written was fulfilled in Jesus. And so he expounds that passage in Genesis 22. He says that um, the single seed, the single offspring of Abraham is Jesus Christ. And he says that any of us can be blessed if we're baptized into Christ and we can inherit those promises to Abraham. Now, the point here is just that the, the, that um, theme um, is repeated and it's kind of under the covers all the way through the Bible. After the middle of Genesis, you, you don't get a, a big exposition of promises to Abraham or promises about this coming ruler. It just from time to time um, comes back to the theme. And, and, and this is written down by all sorts of, of, of writers of the Bible over hundreds of years. So you can see that there's a single message uh, there coming out. And, and you find this with all the big teachings of the Bible, that they are in harmony wherever you look within the Bible. So just before we finish, I've said that there are several authors or writers of the Bible. I've suggested perhaps 40 human writers. One thing that we need to say, and which is fundamental to the teaching of the Bible, is that um, 
is that actually the Bible is a book from God. So back in um, in, in Exodus, um, God says to Moses that he must write down words um, that he has been given by God. And as you go through the Old Testament, many of the prophets, most of the prophets have phrases like, now the word of the Lord came to me, or thus says the Lord. Um, so you get this idea that the writers of the Bible, although they are diverse from different backgrounds and, and at different times, the unifying thing about them is that they are receiving their message from God. And so in the New Testament, um, Peter comments upon that. He says, no prophecy was produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. So people were being guided to write the Bible and to write what God um, wanted them to write. And, and so when we say there are 40 authors of the Bible, another way of looking at it is that there's just one author of the Bible. And, and that accounts for the fact that the message is a single unified message. And so again, Paul writing to Timothy says that all scripture is breathed out by God. So let's just recap what we've found out about the Bible, what it's uh, important for us to know about the Bible. Well, we've said it was written over a long period of time, 1500 years or so, had many authors, but there is good reason to believe that it is an accurate book, um, doesn't have mistakes in it. Also, we've seen that it has a consistent message throughout the book. Um, and this is accounted for by the fact that in fact, there's one author behind the Bible, and that is God himself. And so it deserves our attention. Thank you for watching. Please look at the other videos about uh, the important teachings of the Bible.